mention to you that uh, we have a conference coming up in September, the end of September with Brother Brian Ross. Uh, the theme is going to be Our Sacred Trust. There will be four messages, two on Saturday, two on Sunday morning. So you'll have Friday to travel and get there, and then uh, you'll be free to go home on Sunday afternoon. There's going to be some activities associated with Generation Next. That is a teenager, college and career, young adult group um, originated and, and set up by my daughter-in-law, Hannah. And um, she's going to be having some activities associated with that. The messages that Brian is going to be preaching, he's going to, he's going to do some, some church history things, and he's going to do also some things about, uh, about our sacred trust, the message of grace. So we invite you to join us for that. If you have any questions, you can see me. But September the 27th and, uh, 26th and 27th, that's a Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we're located in the Canton, Ohio area uh, in East Central Ohio, so join us with that. And so um, I mentioned that to you. Also, uh, many of you have probably heard that uh, I'm gonna, I am a grandpa. Um, that those of you that follow the Facebook thing, um, she's due, Hannah is due in February, but I'm none of this waiting to be a grandpa. I'm a grandpa already. <laughs> the bun's in the oven, everything's there, and it's cooking. So we're excited about that. No matter what the Supreme Court says or what society says, we know what the, what the Scripture says, so we're excited about that. So anyway, we're, we're real pleased about that. Okay, you have Acts chapter number 8. We're going to be talking to you this, this, afternoon, or this morning about a study you can understand. If there's one thing that we're here, we're here in common is that we've come to see some things from God's Word about some things that we can understand the Bible. And there's a great example of where I would like to begin this morning. Uh, as we come to Acts chapter number 8, where there's the, the touching story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Let's have a word of prayer, though, before we get started. Our God and Father, we thank you so very much for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the truth of your word, and we pray that as we consider these things, confirmation things to many of us, we, uh, we also pray that these things would be refreshed and renewed in our hearts and rejoiced in as we go forward together in the gospel of the grace of God in this week. And we thank you for all the labor and work that's gone into it, and we just pray for a blessed time. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Ethiopian eunuch has just departed from Jerusalem. And he was there, it says that he went there to worship. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 30. And Philip ran thither and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said unto him, or said, Understandest thou what thou readest? You know, with the, with the eunuch, he had just come from Jerusalem. He had gone to the, to the, to the center of Israel's religion and Israel's spiritual life in time past. And he's reading, you know, we're going to find out he's reading Isaiah chapter 53. You know Isaiah chapter 53, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. He'd gone to Jerusalem, the, the, the capital city, the city of the great king, and missed Jesus Christ. He had gone into the, relig the religious center there. No doubt it, it was probably after the little flock had been scattered and, and, and uh, missed Jesus Christ. And so he's reading his copy of the scripture, Isaiah chapter 53, and... The, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading there, and Philip goes and joins to his chariot and says, Understandest thou what thou readest? That's my favorite question. As I work and as I operate my, my small business and my customers in the area, the six or seven different communities that I work in, occasionally you'll go into a restaurant or you'll see somebody on a park bench reading their Bible or reading a piece of Christian literature. And I'll walk up to them and I'll say, Understandest thou what thou readest? <laughs> great way to open up a conversation and uh, Philip here he's reading the Bible he's got a good heart uh, not Philip um, the, the eunuch he's reading the scripture he's uh, obviously fascinated with it he's got a heart for uh, the things of God to, to whatever degree there and yet he's not understanding what he reads and the, the great thing about Scripture and about the great thing about rightly dividing the word of truth and, the, and the, the thing that we share at this meeting is that we've come to understand some things and, and God's word has become real and vibrant. Many of us traverse through in, in religious circles and activities here and there and, and different places, all different backgrounds, and yet the Bible was still somewhat of a puzzle. And then we were shown a study that we can actually understand. And it brought great joy. Jeremiah the prophet says it right. Thy, thy words were found. There was discovery. 
hey, I, I see some things in the Scripture. Thy words were found. And I did eat them, intake. And food, you know, the analogy of food here, you take in food, you, you, you take in uh, the, the food and it gives you strength, it gives you life, it gives you a capacity. And he says, thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. God's word, instead of being a puzzle and being perplexed, it's now exciting and it brings life. And the eunuch here, he says in verse number 31, how can I? except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Having a a study guide, having someone to walk through the scriptures with and and explain things. Um, Back in the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 8, it says they read the scripture and gave what? The sense. And it says there in Nehemiah, chapter number 8, that the people went away rejoicing with great myrrh mirth because they understood the words that were spoken god's word brings life and brings joy and being it brings excitement and isn't that what we found out isn't that what we've discovered about the grace of god and the word of god that it brings great joy and rejoice because we have a study that we can understand philip says here i need some man to guide me to help me you know there, there's a term that is used uh, oftentimes in, in christian circles and uh, the, the term study guide? You ever heard that term? A lot of times pe- preachers will be teaching on the radio or teaching on television. They'll say, buy, buy, um, call in, send your 1995, and we'll send you a study guide. What's well, a piece of paper and a document? I produce notes and handouts as I, as I preach and teach. But here, a study guide is not a piece of paper. It's a man. And there is a study guide. There, come with me to the book of, of 2 Timothy. There is, a, there is a study guide in God's Word. Not a piece of... Well, it, it is the Scripture. The Scripture is its own study guide. Appreciated what was said earlier this morning about, about no Scriptures of any private interpretation. So, so God's Word and the Holy Spirit teaches using the Scripture, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And, and he says in Ephesians chapter 5, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. The Spirit of God teaches with the Word of God. But there is a study guide in the Scripture. And that study guide is the Apostle Paul. Look at what he says here in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says this, Consider what I say. Verse 7, 2 Timothy 2, 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in what? All things. Isn't that wonderful? That That is an amazing statement where the Apostle Paul, and the interesting thing here, Second Timothy is what we call one of the pastoral epistles. He's writing as the Apostle to the Gentiles to Timothy, who, and, and Timothy, and then in, in, by extension, the, the men that Timothy is training and, and established in the ministry. And here it's all about ministry and the work of the ministry and what it takes to be a good minister. And he says to Timothy, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Really? The Apostle Paul, take and consider and ponder his perspective and viewpoint, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. Amen. Absolutely. That's not an arrogant statement. That's a statement from a very special person in God's Word. And we have a study that we can understand, and it's a remarkable thing that the Apostle Paul does. Now, I want to do two things. I'm going to, by way of confirmation, go over some things, and I'm going to use the the, the visual aids here. And those of you on this side of the room might have a problem seeing some of the things at the bottom. But uh, we're going to do the best I can. But, you know, this is just a tool. Just like the chart is just a tool. The message isn't the, isn't the, the, the catchy visual images. And the message isn't the chart. It's just a tool to help you do what? Understand this. Understand God's Word. So I'm going to, I'm going to share some things with you about I'm going to, some confirmation ministry, the things that we're all familiar with. But there's people on the Internet that are just coming into these truths. There's people here that are new to these things. And maybe you've never seen the the, the chart, this wonderful tool that we have that lays out God's Word. Maybe you've never seen it put together step by step by step. And I remember having, having all the pieces, but watching it unfold and put together gave me some understanding. And for the first time, I saw the Bible as a whole at a glance. 
And wow, what joy. And then once you see the big picture, then you begin to go and you begin to look at and mind the details. So I'm gonna, we're going to have a confirmation ministry and we're going to lay out, the, and, and as you look at the chart, you see the basic outline, but there's a lot of things up there you can't see and you can't read. So I'm going to use some, some visual things and, and with some large print. Maybe this is just a tool that we can use to, um, to, to convey the, the, the same information. But then I'm going to show some things to you about the Apostle Paul and what his ministry does in the way of understanding. You're right here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 15. The Apostle Paul gives us a key for study, doesn't us? Doesn't he? Chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth, not handling correctly. I love that. When you handle the, the new Bible, sometimes you've got to use rubber gloves. Keep your hands clean. That was great. That was great. There's a, there's a, he tells, and, and Paul is telling Timothy, and then by extension, men in the ministry and res, responsibility, men who have responsibility to teach God's word, that there's the way to, to show yourself approved, an approved workman, recognizing the natural divisions and distinctions in God's word. And of course, the apostle Paul, he tells us here to rightly divide the word of what? Truth. It's all truth. Chapter 3. Verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good, all good works. You need it all. When, we're, when, we, when we study the Bible, we don't, we don't discount any part of it. And recognizing Paul's ministry doesn't discount any part of it. In fact... The Apostle Paul gives light and perspective on other portions of, the, of God's Word. And that's a fascinating thing, how he throws the floodlight of progressive revelation and, and, and the, the message that was committed to him on all of the Word of God and, and adds light and understanding to the entire, the entire revelation of God in the Scriptures. So go with me, to, if you would, to the Ephesians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul tells us to consider his perspective and his his viewpoint go to um uh, go to ephesians chapter number two and the apostle paul tells us how we should handle god's word we're to study it not just re not just read it not just not just uh, devotionally consider bits and pieces little nuggets but study get into it and mind the depths and he tells us why to study that we might be approved workmen and he tells us we need it all and in ephesians chapter two there's this wonderful threefold division that the Apostle Paul gives us in, in Ephesians chapter 2 that we all that, that, that we came to rejoice in that just takes the Bible and, and gives it to us at a glance. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So there's a, an area called time past. And then he says, verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Then you see in verse number 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. As Paul tells us to rightly divide the word of truth, there are several things in these, these verses here that give us the natural divisions, natural distinctions for us to, remember, to recognize in God's word. First of all, there's distinctions of time. Time past, but now, and the ages to come. That's not hard, is it? Isn't that something that you can understand? Divisions in time. Time, <coughs> time is the way... We measure events in relationship to each other. And we can see the progression and unfolding of events and, and gain perspective on the way things used to be, the way things are now, and the way things are in the future. And so divisions of time, there are natural distinctions in time. And here's the way things used to be, but now, ages to come. I can understand that. I can get that. Can't you? That's wonderful, simple concept. Well, let's set aside but now for a moment, and let's look at the past. Let's look back at some things, what, what, what he says about time past. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, Wherefore, remember 
that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh uh, made by hands in time past. So when God looked at the word, at the world in time past, he saw a distinction in humanity. He saw two groups of people. You see there, and he's writing to the Ephesians that ye being in time past, what? Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision. So there is a, a group of people called the Gentiles. And then he says in verse number 12 that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of who? Israel. So there's two groups of people in time past. There's the uncircumcision, the Gentiles who are aliens and strangers. And then there is the circumcision, the nation of Israel. That, uh, that term circumcision begins with Abraham and the covenants and the promises that God made with him and, and the program that God had laid out for them. And there's, there's divisions of time. There's time past, but now and ages to come. There's divisions in the Bible between the Gentiles and the nation of Israel. A natural distinction to recognize. There are also divisions of revelation and information. Notice he says in verse 12 that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants and promises. There were covenants and promises given to the nation of Israel, given to Abraham associated with that basic promise of the Abrahamic covenant that foretold and talked about a future a future goal where God would take Abraham's seed and put them on the earth and, and give them their own land and make them a great nation and bless all the families of the earth through Abraham and through his descendants. And so we see the nation of Israel. We also see that within the circumcision, there's a group of people that show up in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John called the little flock. The, the, the group of people within the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel had covenants and promises there. But within the nation of Israel, there was a group of people that responded to the ministry of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ and the 12 apostles, and they became followers of Messiah. And the Lord Jesus Christ, He came unto who? His own. i got to move this side over here. He came unto His own. That's the nation of Israel at large, and His own received Him not. But as many as received him to them gave he power the sons of God and while he was not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel or but to not but the lost sheep of the house of Israel there was a group of individuals that followed him and, and responded to him and so you see these groups of people those are natural simple distinctions to recognize in God's word and you follow those things and you watch those things unfold there are also divisions of location there is the, the purpose for the nation of Israel, and they had a kingdom. They, they, Abraham promised, was promised a land and a, and a piece of real estate because that nation was going to need a place to dwell on the earth. And so there are divisions in the Bible between spheres and, and locations. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When you rightly divide the word of truth, when you divide something, you split it into what? Two parts. The most basic and simple division in our Bible. It's not hard, is it? It's not difficult. There is a, there is a program uh, for the nation of Israel that had been spoken since the world began that concerns the earth and God's purpose for the earth and what God was going to do for the earth. And there was a purpose for the heavenly places as well. Heaven and earth. And all of a sudden, even Genesis chapter number 1 has light and help and understanding in it. You see... In the, in the nation of Israel's program, the Lord Jesus Christ came into his own. His own received him not, and he was crucified and hung on a cross. And you see the, the, the program for the nation of Israel. And the Lord Jesus Christ shows up here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's ministering to a group of people, a small remnant, a group within the nation of Israel that responded to him. But the, his own received him not, and he was crucified on the cross. He dies and was buried and rose again the third day and ascended up to the Father's right hand and sent the Holy Spirit down upon the nation of Israel there on the day of Pentecost, specifically on that little flock. And as you, as you walk through God's Word, you see that program unfold, don't you? And of course, when, as far as history is concerned, as far as time past is concerned, you come as far as the book of Acts and God's program for the nation of Israel and the, the, the kingdom that was prophesied was at hand in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is now offered by the apostles in the book of Acts. 
And the goal is that kingdom and the second coming of Jesus Christ back to the earth. But the Lord Jesus Christ didn't come back yet, did he? He didn't come back to this earth and establish that kingdom. But that is the program that God has been talking about and speaking about since the world began. And you see the Lord Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry and God had something that he was speaking since the world began. Go to, go to Acts uh, chapter number 3. Acts chapter 3, familiar verse that has been mentioned already this morning. Acts chapter 3, verse number 19 and 20 and 21. Peter is preaching there, uh, offers the times of refreshing to the nation of Israel, and he says, says in verse 20, He shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath, what? Spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. Has God been talking about something since day one? The issue in the Scriptures has been the issue of a kingdom and authority on the kingdom and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Matthew says, Come ye blessed of my Father, prepared to inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world you got God's program of prophecy. And, and Moses and the law and the prophets and all that spoke about that. And, and uh, th there was a, a time of Jacob's trouble. Peter in Acts chapter 2 talks about the day of the Lord where the sun is darkened and the moon into, is turned into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Israel has a time of, of testing, yet future. And the Lord Jesus Christ was going to return in power and glory and establish that kingdom. And God has been talking about that since time immemorial. But the wrath didn't come and the kingdom didn't come because God had a secret. God had this great mystery that we're talking about this week, this, this wonderful truth that at, a, at the right and the proper time, the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to the Apostle Paul to Saul of Tarsus who became Paul an apostle, a hidden body of truth that in time past was not revealed. Because it, it was, there was something that God had been speaking about since the world began, but there was something kept hidden, something he didn't tell anybody about. Rather, that wonderful time of grace where we now find ourselves 2,000 years almost where the wrath of God has been delayed and the kingdom, the times of refreshing that, that the prophets had talked about from, since, the, since the world began has been on hold. And we have that wonderful revelation of God's word. And just like the nation of Israel and their program had a goal, had a goal to take the Abraham's seed and the nation and plant them in the earth and make them a great nation and bless all the world through all families of the earth, the church, the body of Christ has a purpose as well has a goal and a destiny and the apostle paul in his message talks about not a coming and a return of the lord jesus christ to the earth but a return where the lord jesus christ descends from heaven with a shout and takes those of us as believers and takes us to be with him to, to be with himself in heaven and those two events the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ, those two events, or if you want to talk, talk it, two phases of the same event, brings great clarity and understanding in God's Word, doesn't it? But it also brings great confusion. When those two events and those two purposes are blended together and the Bible is turned into a gigantic toss salad and snatch and grab method of Bible study and little nuggets and, and, and pieces of truth for you in your daily life when you don't understand the big picture and all of what God is doing. But when you look at it and you see God's Word just unfolds and lays itself out and the second coming of Jesus Christ back to the earth, that's when all these things on earth are going to be made right and not until then. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to, after the church, the body of Christ is raptured out, the, the prophetic program will begin, and the Lord Jesus Christ will descend from heaven. And he'll ride that white horse, and he'll have the armies of heaven following him, and he'll come in power and great glory and in vengeance, and he'll establish that kingdom on the earth, and all of prophecy will be fulfilled. Is that a study you can understand? We just went through that in a, in a short few moments. But as you watch that and you see that put together, all of a sudden, I can get that. <laughs> the great mystery and the great revelation given to the Apostle Paul, he was different, wasn't he, than the 12 apostles. He had a separate and distinct ministry. 
It gives us a study we can understand. And we can go into God's Word, and we can discover truths. We can take them in, and God's Word becomes the joy and rejoicing of our heart. And we can go with joy and great mirth because we understand the words of the Lord and we have confidence and we're established Amen. in that concrete that Brother Terry, Perry was talking about. And you're firm and, and you have this wonderful... We, we see that study that we can understand. And there's some wonderful things about that because... And, and the books of your Bible lay out just in that fashion. You have the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. You have the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the book of Acts, where you have the, 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 the nation of Israel is set aside and, and the new program begins in the middle portion of the book of Acts. You have Paul's epistles, Romans to Philemon, and then the books of Hebrews to Revelation about the ages to come. Your Bible just lays that out for you. That's just the way it unfolds based on... The study guide that we're given in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, there's something about that. And the Apostle Paul is, he gives us a study that we can understand. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you what? Understanding in all things. People like us, the foolish things of the world, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And as we lay aside denominational tradition and, 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 and perspectives and, and, and we come to God's word and we let God's study guide tell us how to enjoy not just what God is doing today, but all of God's word. We see the big picture, but we also see the details. And we have a study that we can understand. And now it's not just Paul's epistles, but it's all Scripture is profitable when it's rightly divided and, 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 and understood that way. Now, I want to give you one more thing. I want to do one other thing. Come with me to the book of Colossians. There's something about this and the study that we can understand as a, as a result of this great mystery. And we understand that the Apostle Paul, and we have the verse here in Colossians chapter 1 that you're familiar with, where Paul is discussing his ministry in Colossians chapter 1, verses 23, 4, along in there, talks about the, the, the body of truth that was given unto him. Verse 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given unto me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest unto his saints. You see there, you see the time element, don't you? You see the revelation element. In time past, in other ages, was this mystery made known? But now it's made manifest, and God wants his saints to know these wonderful news truths. Paul makes an interesting statement there in verse 25. He says, this dispensation of God, this body of truth that was given to me for you, he says, to fulfill the Word of God. And we understand, don't we, that the mystery fills up that great, that, that great unrevealed purpose for the heavenly places and the church, the body of Christ, and now God has a plan, not just for the earth, but for the heavens too. And the Apostle Paul's mes message, the gospel of the grace of God, completes the Word of God. Doesn't it? it fills up that hollow spot, <laughs> what that word fulfilled me. And, and, if it, and, and it, it, it makes known the full plan and purpose of God as far as the content goes, right? And now we have, a, we have all of the, 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 the manifold wisdom of God and now we preach every man and we teach every man and warning every man in all wisdom. We got the whole package. Amen. We got everything that we need. Yeah. But there's something else about this that not only does the Apostle Paul's revelation give us understanding and complete the content of the Scriptures, but it also completes and, and sheds great light and perspective on all of the Word of God. Not just what God is doing today, but Paul throws the floodlight in time past about some things and gives added perspective and light and information about things in time past as well as the ages to come. I want to show, show and just demonstrate that to you. You're here in Colossians chapter number 1. 
we understand some things about creation, don't we? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we have the account back in Genesis about God creating those, the, the, the heaven and the earth and, and the plant life and, and all of the things of this, of this earth, the material universe, the, the, the stars and, and the, the plant life and the animal life. But we see in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, some additional information, some additional perspective on what took place back there as God was creating. Verse number 16, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Not just the oceans and the trees and the mountains and the sky and the planets, but as God was creating through Jesus Christ, He created some positions of rank and authority some positions, he, the things were created there in verse 16, whether they be, not rocks and trees and, and, and birds and cows and dogs and all that, but thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. Verse number 18, and he's the head of the church, the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have dominion, in all things he might have the preeminence. He says in verse 16, the things that are in heaven... And the things that are on earth, visible and invisible. Things you can see and things you can't see. There is visible thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. Things that you can see. Can you see some visible seats of governmental authority, thrones and dominions and principalities and powers? Absolutely. Where are those? On the earth. And the old school dispensationalists used to talk about the dispensation of human government, that God established the rule of man and the principle of government. Not really a dispensation, but it's a truth you see back there in the book of Genesis, don't you? But you see some extra. You see, not only are there, is there positions of rank and authority on the earth that you can see, but there's some positions in the heavens that you can't see because God now has a purpose that He's revealing not just to reclaim the earth, but to reclaim the heavens as well. Added information on all of the Word of God. Wonderful perspective that's there as you see that. Added perspective and light and information. It's amazing as I was thinking about these things. Come with me, if you would, to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 1. How, and I began to go through Paul's epistles and just look for things, look for people, look for events, look for topics spoken about in time past or in the ages to come, that the Apostle Paul, not just in his revelation, talks about what God's doing with us, but talks about and adds more information to even things in Israel's program. In Genesis chapter number, in Genesis chapter number 5, as, as we think about the issue of creation, for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. You know the Apostle Paul says more about Adam? than anybody else in the Bible. The Apostle Paul refers to Adam either directly by name or by the, the first man or by one man about 16 times in his epistles. Just just few references. Job talks about um, uh, that, that I, I cover my sins as Adam. You see Adam mentioned back in Genesis and Adam and Eve and the creation back there. You see a reference in the book of Jude, for example. Jude the seventh from Adam. You see Adam mentioned in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul, the, the key, who is Adam? Who is Adam? He's the first man. And the Apostle Paul says more about man, his nature, and his makeup, and his character, and the problem with man. You, you see it demonstrated? Don't you see the problem with man demonstrated all through the Bible? But Paul brings extra information and more information about the nature it's, the, it's an old sin nature. And we by nature were children of wrath, even as others. And Paul has, the first man came death. The, the, the second Adam came life. In, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. And there's all this, Paul adds information about Adam. You're here in Romans chapter number 1, verse 28. As Paul talks about the, 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 the Gentiles in time past, he says in verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. 
What did God do before he called out Abraham? He gave up the Gentiles. There's Paul showing some light on the book of Genesis and the nature and the character of life and the world back then. The earth was full of violence and every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. You see all those things spelled out. But now you find out about their, their idolatry and God revealed himself in creation and they didn't like to retain God. And Paul has extra light and, and perspective even back there on the book of Genesis. We see that the lost go to Acts chapter number 2 or Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. Romans chapter number 2 and verse 16 in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Yeah, they're going to be judged according to their works and they're going to they're going to receive the recompense in their error that was meat. He says in chapter number 1, and they're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath and he's going to render to every man according to his deeds. But you know where it goes even deeper than that? Paul says he's going to judge the secrets of men by my gospel. And it's not so much the issue of Christ dying for our sins, but the essence of Paul's gospel is that it's a faith alone message. And it's the, it's, it's, it's never, man has never been justified by works and never been justified by what he did, but it's his response in faith to what God had revealed to him at that time and the progressive revelation and unfolding of God. So we see some things that the lost are going to be judged by Paul's gospel. There's the great white throne, ages to come. You see in Romans chapter 3, and we won't take time because Fred did a wonderful job talking about the cross, and Paul takes this prophesied event and he throws the floodlight of revelation about the reconciliation of the world and the, 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 the every man aspect of Paul's ministry now and the every man savior and every man ministry because he gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And Paul throws the floodlight of revelation on the cross and the reconciling of the world. And God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And Paul throws the floodlight of progressive revelation on the issue of the cross and, and the death, burial, and resurrection. It's amazing how many of these things are in the book of Romans. We see Paul in Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4 dealing with the issue of time past justification and how Abraham is an example. Verse 25 of chapter 3 Fred talked about the verse that the payment was made and, and God set forth the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins that are past and God was passing over the sins of time past because he knew Calvary and a payment was coming. So the means whereby God could forgive people in time past was still through the, the, the crucifixion. And then we see in Romans chapter number 4, Abraham as a dual father and an example of faith for all and how Abraham just believed a message that God told him. And God counted it to him for righteousness. Oh, we've been talking about it and it's been mentioned. The issue of the gospel, the issue of, of the, uh, the faith alone gospel that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. Yeah, that's a fact. But how do we appropriate it? Not by our good works, but by resting in the provision that God has made or, and, and the faithfulness of God. Great is thy faithfulness. And Abraham in chapter number four, verse three, just believed what God told him and God counted it to him for righteousness. That's how we're saved today. We rest in the provision and the faithfulness and, the, and the, 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 the payment that God has made for our sins. And Abraham is discussed here. And his faith was counted unto him for righteousness before he was circumcised in verse 10. And he receives the sign that he might be a, a father for the, the nation of Israel. But then he says in verse 12, and the father of circum, the circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. Well, Abraham was walking in faith when he was uncircumcised, but how was he walking? He was walking, recognizing he can't do it. God's got to do it. And Abraham's salvation is an example of time past justification, not on the basis of the law, and the, but on the basis of the promise. We understand from the Apostle Paul the issues of Moses and the law. How much does Paul talk about that law? It was a schoolmaster. It was a ministration of death and condemnation. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And, and instead of the law being a means whereby we can, we can somehow overcome that nature that we receive from Adam, the law actually makes it what? Worse. The strength of sin is... 
the law. And the law brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So the Apostle Paul gives us light and information on the law. He gives us information in, the, in Romans chapter 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 about Abraham and Isaac and, and uh, Ishmael. He talks about Ishmael, born after the flesh in the book of Galatians. And Jacob, and, and not, it was Jacob and not Esau as the channel of blessing through which the promise would go. Paul throws more information about all those things. In Romans chapter 8, we learn, go to Romans chapter 8, verse number 23. We're teaching through Romans in our study, in our um, fellowship. And the Apostle Paul gives perspective on light uh, on life here and now. I call it sonship perspective, where the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, facing the trial and facing the difficulty and the cup that he was supposed to drink from the Father, he, he prays in agony and he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And what does he say? Not my will but thine be done. And the Lord Jesus Christ isn't just throwing up his hand and saying, I'll let you work it all out. I don't know what the plan is. The Lord Jesus Christ knew what the plan was. And that's a statement of resolve and determination that the issue is not my comfort and convenience, but what we're going to accomplish in the plan because he knew the plan. And in the midst of that difficulty and sorrow and, and suffering and difficulty and, and, and the greatest trial he was going to face, he finds resolve and he says, Abba, Father. He had the assurance of God's love and God's uh, care for him and, 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 playing, and playing out in the plan. And so it is with us. We have an appointed lot of suffering as well. And the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse number 18. The suffer I reckon, I count it so that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Over there, how did the Lord Jesus Christ stand up with resolve and, and walk in the plan? Because Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Who for the joy set before him despised the shame and endured the cross because he knew what, was, what it was accomplishing and he knew it was on the other side. Is that a great perspective for us Amen. in life? Amen. That we have an appointed lot of physical suffering. There's some suffering and we're waiting for the redemption of our body while we groan and travail as a part of all the rest of creation. But there's hope yet future. There's glory that's going to be revealed in us. And Paul, even in his epistles, gives some information about the second coming of Jesus Christ and our manifestation there in 2 Thessalonians chapter, two, chapter 1. Verses 7, when he comes in flaming fire and, and taking vengeance on them that know not God, he says he's going to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. We're going to be put on display and there's not going to be just glory revealed to us, but there's going to be glory revealed where? In us. Glory that we already have gives us perspective there. The Apostle Paul gives us so much information. In Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, we learn that the nation, uh, about their stumbling at the cross, and, and because they, Israel sought it not by faith, we learn about their fall and the diminishing away of the nation of Israel, the gradual setting aside of the nation of Israel in the book of Acts. And Paul throws light on that time in God's Word as God was, was setting aside the nation of Israel and, 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 and turning to the Gentiles. We learn about Israel's past and present and future in Romans 9 and 10 and 11. Israel does have a future. He says, this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sin. Is God through with Israel? Absolutely not. And Paul throws the floodlight even on some things out there in the future and confirms the prophetic program. We learn in the four Gospels that the Lord Jesus Christ, you're here in Romans, go to Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. In one verse, a perspective on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Amen? You know something else we learned about the Apostle Paul? We, he uses that little term seven times in his epistles, the faith, what? Of Jesus Christ. 
we learn that the Lord Jesus Christ, and we learn in Philippians chapter 2 that we're to have the mind of Christ who was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was beloved of the Father. He could cry, Abba, Father, because he was one with the Father, that he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a man. And we have that mindset that he had, that he's walking by faith in the, in the plan and the purpose, confirming the promises made of the Father, ticking them off in his, in his earthly life and ministry, that it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled in Matthew uh, particularly. And, and even on the cross, he's ticking off the Bible prophecies. That, that he, he prompts them. He cries out on the cross, I thirst, prompting those to go and get the reed and, and give him the drink that he wouldn't take earlier, that all things might be accomplished, and he gave up the ghost. The apostle Paul throws flood light. We learn about the faith of Jesus Christ and his, his ad adherence to the plan of the Father. We learn in the book of Galatians, chapter 2 and verse 9, 7 to 9, really, we learn about the ministry of Peter and the little flock and Peter's gospel of the circumcision. And Paul throws floodlight back on the, the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ there. We learn, come over to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And we also learn this in chapter 1 about the issue that we've been delivered from the wrath to come. But the Apostle Paul even throws some floodlight on the day of the Lord. He says down in verse number 9, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We learn that the church, the body of Christ, is not to be subject to that time on this earth where the, 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 the pro prophetic program resumes. But we learn that the day of the Lord, he says we're, we're children of light, and children of the day, we are not of the night nor of the darkness. Light and darkness are incompatible, aren't they? And the day of the Lord, Paul throws floodlight back on it. It's a day of darkness and a day of gloominess. But we're not children of the dark, <laughs> children of the night. We're children of the day. He throws perspective on things in the past. In 2 Thessalonians, he gives us extensive detail about the rise and the fall of Antichrist. Go to 2 Thessalonians. Chapter number 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 13, as he talks about all those events that transpire here on this earth, he says in verse 13, but we're bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren beloved of the Father, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. He emphasizes it again that we've been delivered from all of that time as it, as it transpires here on the earth. You know, as you, as you lay that out, the, the basic chart is there, isn't it? But the Apostle Paul gives us so much more light and information and, and perspective on all of the Word of God, not just what he's doing today, but even things in the ages to come and in time past. And it's, it's a wonderful privilege and, and perspective that he gives us there. We learn the issue of prophecy. In the book of Romans, come back to Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15. It's amazing how much of this is in Romans. After we read in Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15 about the, the ministry of Jesus Christ, he says that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again praise ye the Lord all ye Gentiles and laud him all ye people. And again Isaiah saith, and on and on he goes. We learn about the prophetic program. We learn about the prophetic program. And, the, and, and Paul confirms that information. And we, we learn about, that we, we know that God has a program and a purpose for the earth. We also know that this great mystery centers in the fact that God is going to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ through the church, the body of Christ, in the heavenly places throughout all the ages to come. Two quick verses and we're done. Go to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Fred touched on it so we don't have to develop it more fully. But Paul's revelation, he completes the content of the Word of God, but he throws the floodlight of perspective and light on all of the rest of the Word of God. 
Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all. Yeah, the study we can understand. We can come to God's Word and see some tremendous things. Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 9, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. We learn through Paul's message that he created those positions of rank and authority. He had a reconciliation program for the principalities and thrones on the earth and for the principalities and powers and the, the positions of rank and authority in the heavens. And it all centers in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him being glorified in all things, that He might be all in all. Isn't that wonderful? Paul is, is a tremendous study guide. <laughs> we don't need to apologize ever Amen. for emphasizing and magnifying not the man, but what? His ministry and his office. Because he's the key in, revelation, in, in revealing the things of God's Word. Well, i got one more thing I want to show you. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Paul, as he draws his written revelation to a close, as he writes to Timothy, we do have a study guide. We have a study that we can understand because we have a guide to walk us through, a guide that is, that, has, that is established by God himself in the scriptures. You know that Paul, some 60 times in his epistles, refers to his distinct authority, revelation, ministry, or office. It's there. The, the, the scripture teaches it very clearly and very plainly. We have a study we can understand. We have God's study guide to follow. We have the Apostle Paul. Look what he says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. We'll conclude. He says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Even the Old Testament has divine wisdom in it, doesn't it? And the salvation here is not, your, your, your soul is already saved. It's salvation from what? The perilous times that we face where evil men and seducers, the wrong kind of guides to follow, are going to wax worse and worse. What's his answer? Continue in the things that you've learned. And the scriptures will make you wise unto salvation. The Apostle Paul in the Grace Life, he deals with issues of marriage and family and divorce and remarriage. He deals with the issue of, 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 of work life and your godly life, your, 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 your service as you serve the Lord. There's a, there's a full message here that will thoroughly furnish us unto all good works. Amen? Amen. And it's a study we can understand. Amen. We can get it. God put it right down where you can reach it. The problem is Satan doesn't want people to understand it, do they? And he clouds it and he desires to hide man from the simplicity that's in Christ Jesus. God help us. He has. He has. We don't have to pray God. Uh, we just walk in the light that he's given to us. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the confidence we can have in it. We thank you for the gospel that we can believe, that we pass from death unto life from sons of Adam to new creatures in Christ and be a part of what you're doing. And we thank you that, that you desire all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, that you have a pattern for study, you have a guide to follow, and as we consider, you will give us understanding in all things. What a joy. We thank you. It's in Christ's name. Amen. I'm tempted to ask you how many of you have brain freeze now. <laughs> well, you got about two, well, you got one, two and a half hours to thaw.